A fight over a vital federal tax credit intended to kickstart a market for low and no carbon hydrogen and worries over high production costs are cooling near-term expectations for the green hydrogen fuel. Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Alan Onsman, my Forbes colleague and co-author of the Current Climate Newsletter. Alan, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, happy to be with you. You recently reported that green hydrogen's hype hit some very expensive hurdles. So before we dive into what those hurdles actually are, I would like you like it if you could define some terms for our audience. Um, for those who aren't aware, what's the difference between clean hydrogen, green hydrogen, and dirty hydrogen? Well, um, <laughs> pull out your Crayola box because you're going to need to know about <laughs> colors in this case. Um, hydrogen, if you remember your, your junior high or, or freshman year chemistry class, hydrogen's the number one element on that periodic table, um, at, you know, with the atomic number one. It's the most abundant element in the universe. The sun runs on it. It's great. The problem is it doesn't normally exist freely in nature. So to use it, you have to make it from something. Um, hydrogen likes to cling to things. And we use about 92 million tons of hydrogen globally every year for industrial processes, uh, refining oil, making chemicals, fertilizers in the food industry, all sorts of things. And uh, so we already use lots and lots of it. And nearly all of it is made from using steam to pull it out of natural gas, because natural gas is CH4. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's got carbon uh, and four hydrogen molecules. Um, when you do that, you release carbon dioxide. So traditional industrial hydrogen, it's kind of dirty. Hydrogen itself, perfectly clean. No carbon, no nothing on its own. But again, when you have to pull it out of something like methane, natural gas, um, you're releasing CO2. So there has been an effort to really find cleaner sources. If we could get hydrogen without using a fossil fuel source, that would be great. So for several years, there has been a push uh, to find other ways to get cleaner, less polluting hydrogen. Uh, one of the most popular and promising, it's called green hydrogen. And the name is what it sounds like, green in the sense of being very clean. In that case, you just need water, H2O, and some electricity to split it. So rather than steaming it from natural gas, you're pulling it from water, releasing no carbon whatsoever. And what you want to do also is get your electricity from a renewable power source, wind, solar, and in some cases, nuclear is also fine because there's no uh, carbon uh, pollution from nuclear power. So that would be acceptable. And that creates something called green hydrogen. Currently, there's very little green hydrogen available, though. This is something that's been moving out of the lab and is not yet scaled to industrial level. So most of the hydrogen is still very dirty. Uh, and I'll, I'll just toss in one more um, since we're talking colors. The, the dirty form is often called gray. Then you have green, which is the good one. There's one called blue. Uh, to make blue hydrogen, you start with traditional industrial hydrogen, uh, pull it out of, of natural gas. But in this case, you do not allow the carbon dioxide to escape. You capture it and you store it preferably underground. And a lot of oil companies are saying we can do this. Um, that would qualify by some counts as a clean form of hydrogen. However, there is some controversy as to whether that's truly the best environmental option. So we've got green is good, gray is bad, blue is somewhere in the middle? That's right. You got it. <laughs> good. <laughs> so what are the main factors then that make hydrogen fuel so much more expensive than natural gas? Well, um, yeah, yeah, so currently, uh, if you're using it for, say, trucks or buses, um, the supply of hydrogen is very different than natural gas. Natural gas is extremely abundant. We have it all over the place. You can make it from waste. You can drill it from the ground. It's, it, it's everywhere. Uh, it's very cheap, especially in the United States. Um, to get that hydrogen, you now have to add in another layer, an industrial process, to split it from the natural gas. That requires energy and extra equipment. So then that's adding cost. Um, for the story that I reported, um, I looked, uh, I talked to a, um, a, a bus, a transit operator here in suburban Los Angeles, uh, Foothill Transit, and they currently have about three dozen hydrogen powered buses in their fleet. 
zero tailpipe pollution, which is a big thing in California. Uh, the buses run great, not a problem, but the operator pointed out our issue is the fuel for these things is two and a half times our cost for uh, natural gas. The other reason for that is hydrogen is not a commodity product traded like a commodity. There's no daily, you know, there's no barrel of hydrogen price today, you know, like there is for oil or gas. These things um, are fixed markets and with massive supply base. Hydrogen is very specific. If you're a big oil company, you probably make your own. If you're a big chemical company, you make your own or you buy it from a large supplier like a company like Air Products, for example. But there's no open market for hydrogen. So if you want to run your buses on hydrogen or your truck fleet on hydrogen, first you have to find a supplier and then negotiate a price. So for that reason, you know, it creates the opportunity for it to become more expensive. And arguably today it is more expensive than just using natural gas or oil. As we know, Democrats and the Biden administration in particular ran on climate change, ran on preserving the environment. So I am curious, what are the Biden administration's goals for carbon production and usage in the United States? Um, well, the Biden administration is extremely uh, uh, aggressive in promoting hydrogen. Um, and I will say this this is something that I've, I've, I've covered for maybe 20 years. Um, there is no precedent for the level of federal support under the Biden administration that we're seeing now. Um, some years ago, the Obama administration was a little, you know, not interested. Um, they thought uh, for uh, transportation and for clean energy, we're more interested in wind, solar, and maybe batteries for electric cars. Uh, the Biden administration has been more comprehensive, I guess, where they're looking at more options. And to be fair, uh, the technology is has moved uh, over the last decade. So things that weren't really uh, possible a decade ago now are. And primarily, that is uh, a technology called electrolyzers. Electrolyzers are what make the green hydrogen. They do the work to split water to get to make oxygen and, 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 and hydrogen. That technology was not quite as far along a decade ago. And there are many companies that are saying that they're very close to having a, a low-cost, effective electrolyzer system to make all of this green hydrogen. So the Biden administration has been very generous. Uh, both the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill have programs related to the use of hydrogen, the production of hydrogen. Uh, the seven billion dollars were handed out last year for these hydrogen hubs, these big projects involving both public uh, dollars, private dollars, to really, you know, try to be a moonshot to, to, to gen up this industry, to make cleaner hydrogen more widely available, to make it, you know, cheaper. Um, and so the administration's been very, very active in trying to do this. Right now, there's one more piece to that strategy, and this is where things are getting complicated. There is a federal tax credit for the production of clean hydrogen. It goes by the name 45V, it's IRS designation. But what that would do is provide $3 for every kilogram of clean hydrogen produced. So if you are a company that wants to make green hydrogen, which might cost, let's say, you know, $4 a kilogram, if you have that $3 a kilogram uh, incentive, uh, suddenly you're now cost competitive with other forms of energy at that price. And so uh, that is the purpose of the federal um, incentive program. It's to really get this market off the ground. Uh, it would be around for a decade. And the estimate is at, within a decade, the credit wouldn't be needed anymore, that this industry will really have matured and can stand on its own. But there's a big fight over who will get this credit because not all hydrogen is considered clean enough. And at the moment, uh, to be green is good, but to be green, you have to get all of your uh, power from renewable energy. You can't just plug into the grid. You have to get it from new installations of wind or solar or nuclear. Uh, that is making some companies uh, a little angry because they feel that's that's going to be too difficult for them in the early days to find all of this new, you know, widely available wind and solar. And companies that want to do blue, like Exxon Mobil, for example, they don't like it at all because at the moment it doesn't look like uh, their blue hydrogen would qualify for the tax credit uh, and they're threatening to actually halt construction on, on a multi-billion dollar 
blue hydrogen project in Texas as a result. So only as of now, green would get the tax credit, green hydrogen. But would you consider green hydrogen, as we said here right now, kind of a pipe dream? Because earlier you said it hasn't been made to scale yet. Is it too expensive? <clears throat> Is it too impossible to mass produce with the current technology today? Well, that, that's a difficult question to answer um, <laughs> since I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, but uh, based on the number of companies that I'm speaking with, um, there are a great many that have aggressive programs and they certainly believe it will be. They will tell you it's not gonna be price competitive today. It's going to take some time to scale up. So that, that federal tax credit will be very helpful. Um, the same thing happened 20 years ago with uh, solar panels. Um, solar panels were far more expensive years ago. Uh, they also received a very generous uh, tax credit. That tax credit did its job. Solar panels now cost much less than they used to to manufacture. So new technologies, they do take time. So that's sort of where we are right now. Think of where we are with green hydrogen as sort of solar power 20 or 25 years ago, where it was not cost competitive at that time with natural gas or coal or other things. Uh, and now it is. Um, and so there are companies that are very optimistic that they can bring down that cost curve. But I think realistically, they're saying, you know, it's the end of this decade, it's the 2030s where maybe we can hit cost parity. So uh, to say it's a pipe dream probably wouldn't be accurate, but it's not gonna be simple. Uh, it, it is gonna be very difficult uh, to get that cost out, to make it cost competitive. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to predict how these things are gonna turn out. A lot of money has been poured into this and some companies have made some big bets, but we don't know for sure, can they really pull it off? Um, we'll see. Let's talk about those tax credits, 45V. Can you talk about who the critics are and what their criticisms are of the current system? Right, well, um, so last December, uh, the IRS and the Treasury Department, uh, which will determine who gets the credit, uh, working with the EPA, um, they said, okay, uh, to qualify for the full credit, um, you uh, only hydrogen that is made entirely with non-carbon power sources will qualify for this credit. Uh, and uh, also, we want you to get your energy, your electricity from new uh, power sources. So you're not taxing the grid because the grid's already, you know, there are a lot of demands for power. Um, these, uh, a green hydrogen plant would need 100 megawatts or more uh, of power. That's a lot of additional electricity. So the, the government is saying, look, to get the credit, uh, get your power, not only from renewable sources, but also new ones and additional ones. Now, some companies that already are making green hydrogen, like Plug Power, they just opened a plant in Georgia. Um, they don't like that requirement at the moment because they hadn't baked that into their business model. They really wanted to just tap into the grid. Their new green hydrogen plant in Georgia that just opened will qualify because the power comes from a brand new nuclear power plant that just opened in Georgia. So that one's fine, but they have other facilities where they had not baked in new <laughs> renewable power as their power source. A competitor of theirs, a company called uh, Electric Hydrogen, their business model is entirely uh, what the government would like to see, where every project they're planning would be powered by brand new renewable energy. So a new wind farm, a new solar array, they don't wanna be connected to the grid at all. And that's kind of the model for uh, what the government wants to see with these projects. So that's really where it's, it's, it, it stands right now, where you, um, we just had a, a public comment period from all the companies that concluded uh, at the end of March, where they were able to say what they liked or did not like about the tax credit proposal. So the two camps are, are, are sort of split right now, and we're waiting to see later this year what the final version of the rules uh, are to, to get this credit, because the credit's a big deal. Uh, it will you know, help a lot of these companies suddenly get into the market and, and uh, sort of artificially be competitive in the early years, but we don't know the final version of, of the regulations yet. So that remains to be seen, but that, that, is, that is a challenge for some of the companies for sure. Alan, to put it in the simplest terms that you did earlier, gray hydrogen is bad, Green hydrogen is good, 
blue hydrogen is somewhere in the middle. So why is the Biden administration not rewarding at least somewhat the companies using blue hydrogen? Because it does sound like that's a step in the right direction, at least. Well, and that is exactly what the argument is for the companies that, that are pushing uh, blue hydrogen. Um, and actually, some of the other green hydrogen companies say, look, we, we, the rules initially should be a little looser because this is, this is a, an industry in its infancy. And we, we want to let it like walk first before we, we put too many restrictions on it. Um, well, the, the argument against it, um, there are some scientific studies that have been done, a famous one out of Cornell that said, actually, blue hydrogen is worse for the environment um, than traditional gray hydrogen because... Uh, the, the problem is to um, capture that carbon and store it underground is very energy intensive, which means, let's say you're making your hydrogen from natural gas. You make your hydrogen, now you capture the CO2 using more natural gas as your power source to capture it. And um, uh, natural gas pipelines, for example, leak. Uh, methane is a greenhouse gas. So the, the calculations are, if you're capturing the CO2, which can be done, you're also releasing more greenhouse gases from the natural gas that you're using. And at the end of the day, you'd be better off not trying to capture that CO2 at all because you're not accomplishing anything that's good for the environment. Now, that's that's what one particularly well-known study found. Uh, I believe ExxonMobil would disagree with that. I don't think they share that view, um, but that's sort of where we stand. Um, there is certainly an argument from some sectors that let's incentivize everyone to do better. Uh, not everyone can get an A plus on the first day. Um, let's let's gradually increase the standards. Um, and perhaps that's what will happen in the final version of the tax credit. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not clear yet which way it's going to go. As you noted, this industry is in its infancy stages. It's also very expensive as of right now. So what are some yeah. solutions that industry insiders are proposing that help lower costs and get production off the ground? Well, um, I think probably uh, the one that perhaps uh, Plug Power would promote, and Plug um, has probably been at this about the longest of, of, of many of the companies that are in the green hydrogen space. They would say, let's at least back off a little bit on um, the requirement for all of this new renewable power as our really our only power source that we're allowed to use. Let us tap into the grid. Um, that will allow us to begin producing the stuff. Um, we can, you know, we'll get better week by week, month by month. We'll improve our efficiencies. Um, let us do that. Over time, we'll find additional power sources, but let's not phase in from day one um, some of these additional requirements on, on the renewable power component. So that would be an argument I think you would hear from, from some sides. And then, of course, you know, the Exxon Mobiles of the world would say, look, blue hydrogen is, is cleaner hydrogen. Let's do that. I don't know if, if, if the rules will go that far. I suspect there might be more of a grandfathering in on the energy requirement piece here saying, okay, you know, you can use a mix of renewable and some regular grid power for the first couple of years, two or three years, to let them start to scale up. That would certainly help uh, because if you've made your business plan uh, without factoring in this need for additional new sources of renewable power, if you have to add them, that's cost right there. So you're going to take an expensive process and make it even costlier. Um, so perhaps what we'll see is is something more like that, a phased in uh, system in terms of where where your uh, clean power comes from. What markets do people within the industry believe could be good for the early adoption of clean hydrogen? Um, well, uh, a lot. Um, there's great interest for things like steel uh, and sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, Europe in particular, because the United States is not alone in pushing for this, Europe is also very aggressively uh, trying to scale up its own uh, clean hydrogen industry. Uh, this was really actually triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the, the uh, limits on getting uh, natural gas from Russia and the, the risk to the EU. So they wanted to prioritize more domestic uh, clean energy uh, forms. So green hydrogen has been heavily uh, pushed in, in the EU. Uh, and they also are going to be requiring uh, steel manufacturing 
uh, that you use hydrogen, clean hydrogen, in steel manufacturing because steel making is is very very dirty. It, it <laughs> there's a lot of pollution, a lot of greenhouse gases that come from that. Um, ammonia production. Ammonia is used in fertilizers. So uh, for modern agriculture, we use a lot of ammonia. Um, that's made uh, with hydrogen. Um, and so green hydrogen uh, is seen as a source of um, as, as an ingredient for, uh, for for the ammonia market globally. Um, and then there is interest in transportation, mostly for heavy trucks. Um, there are some companies now that are already beginning to deliver hydrogen powered semi trucks. More are coming. Uh, and uh, for long haul trucking in particular, hydrogen seems to work a little bit better than batteries. Um, and so it's a little more practical. So that's another area. Um, and then again, um, sustainable aviation fuel, cleaner jet fuel, where you're blending it in with, with blending in green hydrogen um, to make cleaner types of aviation fuel. Uh, that's a new market that already Europe is uh, again requiring and the US is, is moving to also uh, require airlines to use ever greater uh, amounts of, of sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. And, and green hydrogen would be a component of that as well, potentially. Alan, you're a resident climate and climate technology expert here. So I am curious, what are you looking out for next when it comes to the hype surrounding green hydrogen? Well, um, I, I think a company to watch will be electric hydrogen. I think they their approach is very interesting. It's created by uh, two guys that came out of the solar power industry. So they're very familiar with both renewable power and working with utilities and with industrial customers. Um, and I think their approach will be one to watch. If they can succeed, they already have built in um, some early uh, clients for their product. Um, and they basically have a green hydrogen plant in a box uh, that they'll set up for you and then plug it into a wind farm, for example. Um, if they can continue to land projects and have some success over the next two to three years, I think that will be very promising. So I think that's one company to watch for sure. Uh, I will be very interested also to see in the transportation space, um, the adoption of hydrogen for trucking. Uh, because one of the things I look at a lot is battery powered vehicles as well as hydrogen. Batteries work great for electric cars and for say medium duty delivery vehicles. But if you're hauling 60,000 pounds of goods, 500, 600, 700 miles, Batteries get a little difficult to work with. That's a lot of battery. Um, and so that's an area also where um, hydrogen looks really interesting. Um, certainly many companies like Daimler and Volvo and Toyota and Hyundai, as well as startups like Nikola, all think that's going to be a business. So I think that's, that's definitely an area I'm looking at as well. Alan, thank you so much for your insights and your reporting. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for having me.